Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the cycle of seminars of the astronomy department of IAG. This is actually the last seminar of the semester. So, and the speaker of this week is Dr. Mia de los Reyes. Thank you, Mia, for accepting this invitation. This is truly appreciated. And Mia just recently finished her PhD at Caltech in the US and is about to begin a postdoc position at Stanford University. And afterwards, she's already set to start a faculty position at Amherst College, also in the US. And today, Mia is going to present the seminar using the Lariki archaeology to probe the physics of type 1a supernovae. And questions will be asked after the presentation. And if you're following via our YouTube channel, you can write down your questions in the chat and they will be redirected to Mia by the end of the talk. Before the seminar begins, I would like to ask everyone here at Google Meet to please turn off your microphones and cameras. And Mia, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thanks. Just give me a second to get everything set up. All right. Oh, oops. <laughs> All right, here we go. So thanks again for having me here today. My name is Mia de los Reyes, and today I'll be talking about a lot of my thesis work, which had to do with using galactic archaeology to study type 1a supernovae. So before I get started talking about the science, I just want to take a quick moment and acknowledge that this work is not just uh, because of me. There are a lot of communities who have helped make this work possible. So in my time at Caltech, I have been a settler on the tr traditional and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples. And throughout this talk and throughout my thesis, I've used astronomical observations that were made with the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea. And so they have really only been made possible because Mauna Kea was dispossessed from native Hawaiians or Kanaka Maoli. And then finally, there are a lot of folks, not just my scientific collaborators and my advisor, but also a lot of people who are staff members at academic facilities like Caltech and telescope facilities like Keck who have helped make my work possible. So I really acknowledge these folks. Thanks so much for taking that time with me. All right, so moving on to science. I, my understanding is there have been a number of talks already this semester about galactic archeology span or looking into the past using uh, galaxies. But I think most of those have probably involved the Milky Way. So I think this talk will be a little bit different because I'll be focusing on dwarf galaxies. So when I say dwarf galaxies, I just mean relatively low mass galaxies with stellar masses of less than about 1 billion solar masses. And these dwarf galaxies, I think, are especially useful for a couple of reasons. So first of all, there are a lot, there are a lot of them. For every Milky Way mass galaxy, there's on the order of hundreds of dwarf galaxies. And they're also quite diverse. So looking here at this photo collage, even visually we can see that dwarf galaxies look all kinds of ways. There are some that are sort of spheroidal, there are more irregular looking galaxies, and they also have a wide range of physical properties. So if we look at, for example, stellar mass or star formation rate, dwarf galaxies will span the whole range of parameter space. And that makes them really useful as sort of laboratories for testing hypotheses. Dwarf galaxies are also relatively simple. So compared to a galaxy like our Milky Way, which has a lot of moving parts. There's a bulge, multiple components in the disk, there's a stellar halo, and each of those components has its own accretion history and star formation history. Dwarf galaxies, on the other hand, don't usually have quite so many parts, and so it's a lot easier to untangle physically what's happening in a galaxy. All right, so throughout this talk, I'll mostly be using galactic archaeology to address one specific scientific question, which is uh, type 1a supernovae and the physical processes behind them. So type 1a supernovae are really useful and interesting astrophysical objects. There are, uh, as many of you probably know, they're useful for measuring cosmological distances as standardizable candles. Uh, and so it's especially important to understand the physical mechanisms behind them, especially right now with this ongoing tension over the Hubble constant it's important to understand the systematics that go into type 1a supernova measurements. We've had this sort of classical picture of what type 1a supernovae are for quite a long time. This picture involves a white dwarf accreting matter from a non-degenerate companion star until the white dwarf approaches the Chandrasekhar mass of around 1.4 solar masses. And at this point, the temperatures and densities get high enough for a runaway nuclear fusion uh, process to start in the white dwarf, and this ends up unbinding and exploding the entire star. And this is sort of the classical picture that we've had for quite a long time, but in the last few decades we've begun to realize that this textbook picture is probably not the whole picture. 
And this has led to this whole industry of uh, coming up with alternative models for type 1a supernovae. And I could easily talk all day about all of these alternative models, but for today's talk, I'll just classify them into sort of three main categories based on assumptions in the original model that we're going to tweak. So for example, instead of a prompt supersonic detonation of a white dwarf, perhaps we can sort of prolong the explosion a little bit using a deflagration, a, su a subsonic deflagration. Or maybe instead of, uh, we can change the mass of the white dwarf. Instead of a white dwarf exploding at the Chandrasekhar mass, maybe we can get a less massive white dwarf to explode. Or maybe we can change the number of white dwarfs involved. So rather than just one white dwarf accreting from a non-degenerate companion, maybe we have two white dwarfs that are merging or accreting with each other. And so first I'd like to focus on this middle question about the mass of the white dwarf. Uh, so one way to distinguish between these two classes of models is by measuring the nucleosynthetic uh, out the nucleosynthetic uh, <laughs> processes that occur in these uh, nucleosynthetic products. There we go, that occur from these supernovae. So in particular, I'm interested in manganese. I am a manganese of manganese because it turns out that manganese, the amount of manganese produced in a type one A supernova, depends quite a lot on the mass of the white dwarf uh, at, before it explodes. And the physical reason for that is a little complicated. I won't get too much into it, but it has to do with the parent nucleus of manganese, which is cobalt-55. And the uh, presence of cobalt-55 depends a lot on the density. And you can, you can actually see that here. So here I'm plotting the overall density as a function of the enclosed mass of a white dwarf. And you can see that as soon as you get above this density cutoff, this dotted line here, this is where we start to make a lot of manganese. And so this is useful because the core density of a white dwarf is actually proportional to the mass of the white dwarf. And so this lets us uh, directly see this effect when we look at theoretical type 1a supernova models. So here I've listed a bunch of theoretical models. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting the amount of manganese produced by these models. So for those who are not familiar, this is what we call bracket notation. So it's logarithmically scaled to, to solar. So zero is solar abundance and then minus one is one-tenth solar abundance and so on. So if we look at the theoretical models above this dashed line, all of these ones up here, these are the more massive explosions or the explosions of massive white dwarfs, the ones that are close to the Chandrasekhar mass. And we see that the, these explosions, these near Chandrasekhar mass explosions tend to produce relatively high, so solar or even super solar yields of manganese. But below the dashed line, the less massive white dwarf explosions typically produce significantly subsolar manganese yields. So if we could just measure the manganese yield from type 1a supernovae, we could easily distinguish between these two classes. We could try to do this directly. So directly look, observe type 1a supernovae and try to measure the amount of manganese in, from X-ray spectroscopy or late time light curves. But it turns out that's really hard to do. It requires quite detailed spectroscopy. Uh, and has really only been done for a handful of very bright and very close by type 1a supernovae. So instead, I'm going to measure the amount of manganese indirectly using galactic archaeology. The idea is to measure manganese from past type 1a supernovae that have since been incorporated into stars that are alive today. And in particular, I'm going to look at stars in local group dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So again, these dwarf galaxies, there's a lot of them, and they're very diverse. And because they're in the local group, they're also pretty easy to observe. The, the major things affecting their chemical composition. And to measure the manganese in these stars, in these galaxies, we're going to use medium resolution spectroscopy with Keck DEMOS. So DEMOS is a multi-object spectrograph. And we're going to use medium resolution spectroscopy instead of the sort of traditional high resolution spectroscopy, mostly because it helps us get a really large homogeneous sample. Of, of stars, as we'll see in a second. And so this allows us to measure, a, a, to measure manganese for a very large catalog of stars in these dwarf galaxies. So let me quickly show exactly what these data look like. I think it's just nice to actually see what we're working with. In the top left panel, this is a full spectrum of one of, one of the stars in our sample. This is, I think, from Sculptor Dwarf Spheroidal. And the green lines shown here are the regions where the manganese lines are. And we can see that quite a lot of the manganese lines are in the blue part of the spectrum. And so this, this measurement was actually 
not that easy. We had to commission an entirely new grading on Keck Demos just to get at these, this blue region. And in the bottom, I've sort of zoomed in on a part with a lot of manganese lines, so you can see what that, the data actually look like. And this is where the medium resolution part comes into play. So if we look at any of these green regions, we see that the black observed points don't really make nice lines. We don't really see, like for instance, this thing here, it doesn't really look like the nice Gaussian or Lorentzian spectral line profile that we might expect to see from very high spectral resolution. But we can get around that. Instead of fitting individual lines, which is what's usually done for high resolution spectroscopy, we're going to fit all of the lines simultaneously. And by doing this kind of spectral synthesis, even though the lines themselves might not look that clean, we can still get a pretty precise measurement of the amount of manganese. So that's actually shown here. The blue line is a theoretical spectrum that doesn't have any manganese at all. You can see it's just not a very good fit for the spectrum. The red line is the best fit spectrum, and it's this that allows us to get a precise measurement of the amount of manganese. All right, so we can do this for a lot of stars. And we have our, again, large self-consistent catalog, but then we have to figure out how much of the manganese in these stars comes just from type 1a supernovae. So many things can make manganese and we just want to disentangle the amount that comes just from type 1a supernovae. So we do that using a plot that looks a little like this. For folks who don't do galactic archeology, span I, I know they can be difficult to read, so bear with me here. On the x-axis, I'm plotting the overall metallicity, which is traced by iron. And this is really a proxy for time. So at older times, at you know, earlier times in a galaxy, the metallicity is lower. So you can really just think of this x-axis as a time axis. On the y-axis, I'm plotting the magnesium over iron. So this is magnesium, not manganese. Uh, and the magnesium over iron ratio is really a tracer of the ratio of core collapse to type 1a supernovae. And this is because magnesium is what we call an alpha element, which is predominantly produced by core collapse supernovae. So if that doesn't make a lot of sense, I think it again helps to actually look at the data. So here are some observed points from Sculptor Dorsoidal Galaxy. So these black points here, uh, you can see at early times, at low metallicities, the magnesium over iron ratio starts out very high, close to this blue line, which is what we expect from core collapse supernovae. And that makes sense because at early times in a galaxy's evolution, only core collapse supernovae have had a chance to go off. But at some point, type 1a supernovae begin exploding. And type 1a supernovae produce a lot of iron, but not a lot of magnesium. And so they overall pull this trend down as more and more type 1a supernovae go off, they begin to drag this ratio down. And so we see sort of this classic trend of a plateau and then a knee and then a turn down or decline. And we can convert that into a useful quantity, which we'll call F1a. It's just the fraction of metals that come from type 1a supernovae. And we do this by observing that this, this red trend, this plateau and then the knee and then the decline, is really just a linear combination of the amount of, manganese, of magnesium coming from type 1a supernovae and the amount of magnesium coming from core collapse supernovae. So it's a combination of the blue and the green lines. And so we can use that to actually solve for this quantity F1a. And then once we know F1a from something like magnesium, then we can use F1a to compute this green quantity for other elements like manganese. So this is the thing that allows us to figure out how much manganese comes just from type 1a supernovae. And so when we do that for, let's start with one dwarf galaxy. Again, I'm choosing Sculptor because Sculptor is, I think, one of the easier dwarf spheroidal galaxies to work with. When we look at Sculptor and we compare it to our theoretical models, the theoretical predictions of manganese, we find that our observations predict this amount of, mang of manganese, which is subsolar, so it's less than zero, which suggests that it's the less massive type 1a supernovae that dominate. Although it's sort of in between these two groups enough that you actually do still need some amount of more massive type 1a supernovae to produce this observed uh, yield right here. But this is just one dwarf galaxy. If we start to look at other dwarf galaxies, it gets a little more complicated. So here again, we're plotting Sculptor and we're plotting the overall manganese abundance as a function of overall metallicity. And Sculptor, again, is, is plotted in dark purple, and the points are really low. So they have really low manganese abundances. 
And that makes sense because as we just discussed, we think that Sculptor was really dominated by these low mass sub Chandrasekhar mass type 1a supernovae. But if we look at other dwarf galaxies, other dwarf spheroidal galaxies that are similar to Sculptor, we see that they actually have much higher manganese abundances, even at the same metallicity. So there's sort of a systematic discrepancy between Sculptor and between galaxies like Leo 1 and Fornax. And Leo 1 and Fornax actually have close to solar manganese abundances, which is what we expect from the more massive white dwarf explosions. So then the question is, why are these two different? This discrepancy is large enough to suggest that there's a real difference, a physical difference in the nucleosynthetic source of manganese, but where, why is that difference happening? And we think it has to do with the star formation history of these systems. So Sculptor has what we call an ancient star formation history. It formed all of its stars really early, at uh, early, like within a short, you know, few billion year burst. And it's sort of been sitting passively ever since. Whereas Leo 1 and Fornax have more extended star formation histories. They've been steadily forming stars over the last 13, 14 billion years. So what this tells us is that at early times in galaxies like Sculptor that are super ancient, it's these sub Chandrasekhar mass type 1a supernovae that dominate. But then at later times, if your star formation history is extended enough to actually see this happen, there's a transition to more massive type 1a supernovae. So on its own, that's actually really interesting. The fact that we're going from a transition to, from low mass to high mass type 1a supernovae is kind of weird. The most processes in astrophysics, as we know, typically go from high mass to low mass. So stellar evolution, for example, it's the high mass stars that explode first or that die first. And so this is something that we'd like to uncover a little more. So, so far I've really only shown examples of three dwarf spheroidal galaxies that have a star formation histories that are sort of at extreme ends. So Sculptor is sort of extremely ancient in, in that it formed all of its stars very quickly and then nothing since then. And Leo 1 and Fornax are both sort of extremely extended. And so right now we're working on measuring uh, manganese abundances from a much more diverse range of dwarf spheroidal galaxies. And the goal is to understand whether or not this transition is a real thing and you know if it's an abrupt transition uh, or if it's a more gradual transition. So, so far we've already learned quite a lot just about uh, type 1a supernovae from measuring this one element. But there are other things that we can also do using galactic archaeology. So if we go back to this sort of motivation slide, instead of talking about this second uh, question for the channel of type 1a supernovae, I'd like to turn our attention to the last question, the number of white dwarfs involved in the supernova explosion. All right, so we're going to try to distinguish between the single degenerate model with just one white dwarf and the double degenerate model with two white dwarfs. And to distinguish between these two, we can use something that's called the delay time distribution of type 1a supernovae. So for folks who don't necessarily work with supernovae a lot, this is sort of a weird thing to think about, but it's really an impulse function. It's a response. If you have a delta burst of star formation at time t equals zero, then at some point after that, we begin to see supernovae. And the rate of supernovae after this burst of star formation is what's known as the delay time distribution. And this delay time distribution, or DTD, is actually really sensitive to the physics of the, of the supernova. So for example, if we look at uh, supernova models that involve a binary in spiral, so this includes most of the double degenerate models, uh, the delay time distribution from general relativity can actually be shown to, and it should be proportional to t to the minus one. And this is just because if you compute how long it takes for a binary system to in spiral towards each other as a function of radius, and then compare that to the distribution of binary radii for uh, binary white dwarf systems, you get something that's close to t to the minus one. On the other hand, if we look at the single degenerate model or models in which mass accretion is the primary thing that's setting the time scale of explosion, the models are actually kind of all over the place, but there are a couple of common features and one of them is a relatively sharp drop off. So we expect that after a few gig years, it gets really difficult to explode very low mass white dwarfs. And this is because, again, because of binary evolution, uh, we expect more massive binary systems to form and evolve first, or to evolve first rather, 
And then over time, you get to lower and lower mass white dwarf and white dwarf binary companions. And eventually, the binary systems get so low mass that the white dwarf actually doesn't have time to accrete anywhere close to the Chandrasekhar mass within a Hubble time. And so we see sort of the sharp cutoff here. So I mean, the general idea is that we want to measure the shape of the delay time distribution and again, compare it to these two different models. And that will tell us something about the class of models that we're working with. So the delay time distribution can't really be measured directly. It has to be measured because it's again, a response function. So what we can instead measure is the rate of type 1a supernovae. The delay time distribution, when you convolve it with the star formation history, gives you the rate of type 1a supernovae. And so this has been done multiple times in the literature. People have counted, have measured the type 1a rate by counting type 1a supernovae as a function of time in galaxies where we know something about this star formation history. And so typically this has been done in one of two ways. Either you pick a population of galaxies where you can assume something about the star formation history, and then you count type 1a supernovae as a function of time, as a function of redshift. And this works fairly well, although there are a couple of assumptions that you have to make. So for example, when you look at any given galaxy, the number of type 1a supernovae is usually either zero or one. So you really need a large sample of galaxies in order to get any sort of statistical meaning uh, out of this type 1a rate. The other way to do this, instead of looking at large populations of galaxies, you can look at individual galaxies. And instead of counting type 1a supernovae as a function of redshift, we, we measure uh, supernova remnants and we use their ages as a function of time. So again, this works pretty well, except it is actually really hard to measure supernova remnant ages. And so both of these types of measurements are roughly consistent with a t to the minus one power law for the delay time distribution, which again is what we expect for the sort of double degenerate models. But there are some caveats. Again, there are pros and cons to both of these types of measurements. So for when we look at large galaxy populations, we get a really detailed time resolution, but you have to make this assumption that all of the galaxies in your population have basically the same delay time distribution. On the other hand, if we look at individual galaxies, we don't have this issue. We can, we can assume whatever we want about the delay time distribution, but because it's so difficult to measure the ages of supernova remnants, you don't really get a significant time resolution. So what we would really like is the best of both worlds. We want to measure the time resolved delay time distribution in just one galaxy. And we think we can do that using galactic archaeology. So again, if we go back to our former observation uh, of the magnesium over iron rate, Remember we said that magnesium is an alpha element, and so this ratio here traces the ratio of core collapse to type 1a supernovae. This actually gives us a number ratio of, if we make some assumptions, we can get a number ratio of the number of type 1a supernovae to the number of core collapse supernovae as a function of time, in this case metallicity. So if we just multiply this by the number of core collapse supernovae as a function of metallicity, then we get number of type 1a supernovae as a function of, of time. And just really quickly, we get the number of core collapse supernovae by looking at the metallicity distribution function, which is exactly what it sounds like. We measure metallicities of a lot of different stars and plot a histogram. Uh, but what it's physically telling us is at each metallicity bin, the number of stars that are being formed. And if you assume something about the IMF, if you know how many stars are being formed, you can easily get a number of core collapse supernovae in each metallicity bin. So putting all of this together, we get a rate of type 1a supernovae, which is exactly what we wanted. And I, the goal is to then compare this to a, a model rate. So this is sort of our observed rate, and we want to compare it to an expected rate, which we get by plugging in delay time distributions and convolving them with star formation histories, and the, which is again traced by the metallicity distribution function. So this, seem, this method seems to hold up on paper, but one of the major issues is that all of the observed quantities that we have here are functions of metallicity. And the delay time distribution is a function of time. So in order to get a meaningful rate of uh, type 1a supernovae, we need to convert metallicity to time. And this is imaginatively named, uh, done with the age metallicity relation. 
which is exactly what it sounds like. It's the relationship between the age of a star and its metallicity. And it's commonly measured using photometry. So when we have resolved stellar populations, uh, we can just fit model isochrones to color magnitude diagrams, and that will tell us something about the overall age and metallicity of the stars. The main issue, this works pretty well for most systems, uh, but it is uniquely disadvantaged when it comes to really old and metal poor systems like dwarf spheroidal galaxies. And this is because isochrones tend to bunch together uh, when we get to really high ages and low metallicities. And the age metallicity degeneracy becomes a major uh, effect here. So I, I think a good analogy for this is looking at bananas. If we're looking at the colors of bananas, uh, it's really easy to tell apart relatively young bananas. It's, it's easy to tell that this banana is younger than this banana. But once all of the bananas get really old, <laughs> once we're looking at bananas that are all, you know, more than a month old, they all just look kind of the same. It's really hard to tell which of these is the oldest banana. And so to get around that, instead of looking at colors, we'll use the chemical abundances of these stars. So we'll use spectroscopy rather than photometry to measure the star formation history of a, of a galaxy. And so this is not a new idea. People have used chemical evolution models to model galaxy evolution. Uh, but this is sort of the first time that our goal is to get out a star formation history just from spectroscopic information. And we do this by fitting abundance ratios of a lot of different kinds of elements. So alpha elements like magnesium, which are mostly produced by core collapse supernovae, iron peak elements like iron, so here's the metallicity distribution function, uh, but also S process elements or elements that are mostly produced by AGB stars. So this is really helpful because AGB stars sort of get at the intermediate time range between really massive core collapse supernovae and relatively low mass stars that explode as type 1a supernovae. So AGB stars sort of tell us about this intermediate time range. And so by modeling all of this, I'm happy to go into more detail if there are questions about this chemical evolution model. But we're able to resolve these age spreads in really old and metal poor populations like Sculptor, for example. And so our star formation history is shown here in black. And we're able to use this to get an age metallicity relation as well. So going back to the whole reason, that was sort of a bit of a sidebar, but going back to the whole reason why we wanted to do this, we wanted to be able to convert all of these quantities to functions of time. And now we can do that now that we know something about the age metallicity relation. And we can compare the observed and expected rates of type 1a supernovae and tell us something about the delay time distribution. So we've started doing this. This is all preliminary work. Uh, so results are also liable to change in the next few months. Uh, but here I'm plotting the type 1a rate as a function of time, which is what we measured, both from our observations, the observed rate, and the expected rate, which comes from a model delay time distribution. So here what I'm doing is just changing the power law of the delay time distribution, the power law index, to see what the overall effect is. Our goal again is to match the dark colored regions, the observed rates, and the light colored regions, which are the expected rates. And so by eye, we can see already that for some delay time distributions, the observed and the expected rates just visually don't match at all. Uh, so for example, here, a very shallow delay time distribution of t to the minus 0.5 clearly does not explain um, the observed and expected rates very well. On the other hand, if we look at steeper power laws, t to the minus 1, t to the minus 1.5, we actually get fairly good agreement. So we can quantify this a little better on the plot on the right. Here I'm just plotting the percent error in, his, in, in histogram. And if the observed and uh, expected rates match, then we expect sort of a Gaussian uh, histogram, a Gaussian distribution uh, centered at zero. And we see that for these two power laws. We can play the same game with other parameters in the delay time distribution. So not just looking at the power law index, but also the minimum delay time, so the shortest time after a burst of star formation that you can get a type 1a delay time to, uh, a type 1a supernova. And again, we see that for very short minimum delay times and very long minimum delay times, the observed and expected rates visually don't match. And you can, again, quantify that and see that in the probability distribution function. 
And so instead we need sort of an intermediate minimum delay time of around 100 mega years. So putting that all together, what that tells us is that the delay time distribution in this one test case, in this one galaxy, seems to agree with a t to the minus one power law and a minimum delay time of around 100 mega years, which is pretty much consistent with what we expect for the double degenerate model, sort of the canonical double degenerate models. So all of these things are things that could be built on, right? So we mentioned manganese earlier and how we can measure manganese in more dwarf galaxies, but also the delay time distribution is it's still preliminary work and there's a lot to be done still. We'd like to ideally measure the delay time distribution without assuming anything about its form. So we'd like to do it in a non-parametric way. And we'd also like to try this in a lot of other galaxies. So far, we've only tested this in one galaxy. And we wanna see if the delay time distribution is really universal, if it's the same in all galaxies or if there's a dependence on something else. And so ultimately, the, I think the useful thing to take away is that galactic archaeology can give us really unique constraints on theoretical models for type 1a supernovae. So really quickly in the remaining time, I do want to mention that I, I work on other things too, and I'm also happy to talk about these if anyone is interested. So first of all, uh, the other half of my thesis was studying galaxies in cosmic voids, so extreme low density regions in the local universe as shown here. Here's a dark matter density plot from Illustrious, and we can see that between the cosmic filaments are these very empty looking cosmic voids. Uh, but the voids aren't totally empty, and there are galaxies, including dwarf galaxies, in these voids. So these are super useful, partially because they're so isolated. Uh, they're very good for directly comparing with simulations of isolated galaxies. Uh, but also because they're, even visually you can see, they're, they're relatively blue and faint, they're relatively star forming compared to their counterparts in cosmic filaments. And that suggests that they're actually analog galaxies for high redshift galaxies. So I have obtained IFU data for a lot of these dwarf galaxies using the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. And now I'm trying to address questions about the kinematics of these systems. So we'd like to understand whether or not dwarf galaxies form disks, for example. So some recent work has shown that dwarf galaxies might actually form as puffy systems, or the canonical thinking is that dwarf galaxies form as disks, sort of cold disk-like structures. But actually at low masses, it's possible that they instead form as puffy dispersion-supported systems instead. And so this is seen both in galaxy simulations and in our local group. But our local group, uh, the galaxies in our local group are affected by the Milky Way and by M31. And so the goal is to see if this effect extends all the way out, if we uh, increase this x-axis, which is the distance to the closest mass of galaxy, by a lot, the void dwarf galaxies would be way out here somewhere. And so our goal is to measure the kinematics of these systems. And so far what we've found is that even these void dwarf galaxies, even though they're totally isolated and very far away from the, their nearest neighbors, they do also seem to be relatively puffy and dispersion supported. So they have low uh, rotation velocity over velocity dispersion, V over sigma ratios. So what this suggests is actually maybe just all low mass galaxies seem to form as puffy systems rather than disks. And so maybe there's some cutoff here below which you get puffy systems and then above which you start seeing disk galaxies. We can also start to uh, measure the metallicities of these systems with IFU data. We can look at their chemical abundances, and maybe that'll tell us something about the overall gas phase metallicities in these systems. So there have been a number of conflicting reports about the whether or not void dwarf galaxies have lower gas phase metallicities as non-void dwarfs, but almost all of these studies have used fiber spectroscopy, so mostly SDSS. Um, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And these fiber spectra really only sample the light from part of these galaxies. So IFU data will allow us to measure metallicities across the entire galaxy, as shown here. And so the goal is to instead uh, <laughs> make emission line maps and measure integrated gas phase metallicities across entire galaxies. All right, and then last, <laughs> another abrupt switch of topic. But the other thing that I'm really interested in are star formation laws. So in 1998, Rob Kennicott wrote sort of a classic paper uh, 
about the global star formation law, which is just the relationship between how much gas is in a galaxy, the gas surface density, and how quickly stars form in the galaxy or the star formation rate surface density. And it turns out that if you plot a lot of galaxies, so each of these points now are individual galaxies, and if you plot many galaxies and fit a line to it, in 1998, Rob found that you find a power law with an index of around 1.4, which for theorists is useful because it's basically 1.5 or 3 over 2. And that can tell you useful things about, about um, it was sort of a good confirmation of our understanding of star formation. But it's also useful as a recipe for creating stars in cosmological simulations. And so the main issue is that in 1998, our data were not as good as they are today. So here, I replotted Rob's original data. So these are just the points from these spiral galaxies down here. And now I've plotted them with error bars. Uh, and we can see that the it's, it's a little bit difficult to see how you might easily fit a line, a convincing line, with a convincing slope there. But now, two decades later, we've remeasured these same points and also added a lot of new data points. And now I think it, we can more confidently say that the global star formation law does actually have a slope close to around 1.4, even if you just look at spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. We can also start looking at other types of galaxies. So not just spiral galaxies, but also dwarf galaxies, which are my personal favorite, uh, as well as starburst galaxies, so really high density, high star formation rate density systems. And we see that both of these starburst galaxies and dwarf galaxies, neither of them actually seem to follow the same star formation law as typical Milky Way-like spiral galaxies. So that potentially tells us that there, there are things we don't understand yet about the, the primary physical processes that are driving star formation in these systems. Uh, there are also a lot of systematics that go into all of these measurements. And again, I'm happy to talk about all of this if folks are interested. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna Summarize, quickly summarize everything we've talked about. From the galactic archaeology end, we've seen that from manganese, we can understand something about the mass of type 1a supernovae in dwarf spheroidal galaxies. We can also uh, overall model the chemical evolution of these systems, and that will tell us something about the star formation histories. And then we can use that to actually measure the delay time distribution in just a single galaxy, which to our knowledge has not been done in a time resolved way before. I've also talked a little bit about my work with void dwarf galaxies and understanding their kinematics and with star formation laws. So trying to understand how stars form both in local spiral galaxies, but also other types of galaxies as well. So I know that was sort of a whirlwind tour of a lot of different topics, but thank you so much for having me. I hope it was at all interesting and I'm happy to answer questions about any of these things. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. Uh, it was quite clear, although it was kind of a lot of technical things like time <laughs> distribution and star formation laws. But the, the, the slides are so beautiful and they helped a lot. So thank you so much. And uh, we actually have questions already. Okay. Helio has a question. Go ahead, Helio. OK, uh, I think I have three questions, but mm -hmm. uh, you, maybe they are correlated. So first, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was really nice. I'm not um, to I'm most uh, observational astronomer, so my questions are more going in this direction. Maybe you can answer me. So okay. uh, first, I wanted to understand if you could uh, to apply your method or this uh, analysis where you try to model the star formation history mm -hmm. uh, to the recent discovery ancient uh, uh, structures in the Milky Way or in the stellar streams that you have in the Milky Way. So the second question, mm -hmm. can I do all the questions? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. OK, so the second question is, um, I don't know if you can use the Apogee data, because as you know, the metal is range is to about minus 1.8 dex. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you need to go more to the direction of metal poor stars to do this kind of uh, um, modeling and the third question is um, how about the completeness uh, of the survey uh, is this a problem to you obtain star formation history and how it gonna have some uh, how can it affect your results so this okay. is the, the three questions yeah. 
Okay, Thank you. those are great questions. Thank you so much. Can you still see my screen and yes. slides and everything? Okay, yeah. So really quickly, let's see. The all right. So the first question was about uh, whether or not we can use this kind of modeling on stellar streams. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Stellar streams and the ancient events like uh, the guy in Celadus or Helm streams and all these other structures that are yeah. used to cover. So this is actually something that I've talked about doing with a number of folks. I think it would be possible. It would be difficult to do, as you mentioned, with Apogee. I, I do think that we really need a lot of the metal core stars to say anything, to, to have good constraining power, particularly at the low metallicity end. Yeah, so for, for the alpha elements in particular, it's really useful to be able to see this alpha turn off this knee. So without low metallicity stars, that can be really difficult to do. So I think Apogee would not help a lot for it, but I do think that it's possible. I think the biggest issue then would be selection effects. So for dwarf spheroidal galaxies, I think the selection criterion is, is much simpler. Uh, it's much easier to, dis to figure out which stars actually belong to the dwarf galaxies. And we did do some tests to see what happened if we accidentally had some contamination, uh, or if some of our stars were not actually in, or if we were missing stars. Um, and from the, the other selection thing that affects dwarf spheroidal galaxies is the radial extent. So most of these stars are within the sort of effective radius of a dwarf spheroidal galaxy, which means we are missing uh, stars that are at a larger radial extent. So we, we discuss a little bit the potential implications of that in our work, uh, especially because this is what we call a one zone chemical evolution model. So we're sort of assuming that the entire galaxy is very well mixed. And that I think works okay for the most central portions of a galaxy. But when we start to consider larger radial extents, uh, it's possible that we actually need a multiple zone model to fully model, uh, to more correctly measure uh, or co more correctly model the chemical evolution of these systems. Uh, so I think, so I think at this point <laughs> I've mentioned that Apogee I think is not the ideal survey for doing a lot of this work. And I think I've talked about the selection effects, but I do still think it's possible to do this in stellar streams as well as other systems. So actually what my group is working on are ultra faint dwarf galaxies. I th yeah, I think the biggest issue is that the selection effects, it's not clear to me if the, you know, chemodynamical cuts that people put in order to distinguish the Gaia Enceladus sausage from the Sequoia system, for example, it's not clear to me that there wouldn't be a lot of contamination and that might be very difficult to deal with. Does that make sense? Sorry, that was quite a long and rambling answer. Oh, yes, it makes sense. Ian, thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you, Elio, for your question, and thank you, Mia, for your complete answer. I actually also have some questions. The first of them would was regarding Apogee. So mm -hmm. I guess you, we just discussed that. We could go, go deeper into that okay. after everybody has asked everything. So the questions that I have is, what does it actually mean, a Subchandra Zekar supernova, like physically? Because what I've always understood is that Subchandra Zekar supernova would be like binary systems of, of uh, white dwarfs that are mm -hmm. merging eventually. But you differentiate yeah. those, those kinds of systems. Yeah, so they are sort of distinct. Um, you can get a Subchandra Zekar mass supernova with a non-degenerate companion if the non-degenerate companion is mostly donating helium. So the, the most common mechanism is known as the double detonation mechanism which is really unfortunate because it sounds a lot like double degenerate and then you have to <laughs> try to keep those straight. Um, but the idea is that you have the, a, a low mass white dwarf that's accreting a lot of helium material onto its surface. The helium detonates on the surface and then this sets off a core detonation. Like the, the shock waves from this helium surface detonation go into the core, compress the core and cause a core detonation. Does that make sense? So there are actually models in which you can have a sub Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf exploding while it's still a single degenerate uh, okay. model. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for that. Yeah, that yeah no, it's, it's really, 
there are a lot of models out there and they're all quite confusing. Okay, so the second question that I have is, uh, I don't know if I'm going too far, but I don't know, maybe people have asked you about that, but does it have any implications to, I don't know, the determination of the Humboldt constant, for instance? Because I don't know if we have just different physics for type 1a supernova, it would just mess up entirely the, the, the distance ladder, for instance, if you use like Cephates measuring distance to galaxies no, with type a... 1a supernova. This is a really good question. I, I do actually think that although understanding the systematics that could affect our Hubble constant measurements is really important, I, I don't actually think that um, it, we're likely to upend the entire use of, of type 1a supernovae as standardizable candles. And this is for a couple of reasons. So first of all, when people measure the Hubble constant from white dwarf, from supernova explosions, uh, they're usually quite careful about which type 1a supernovae they use. So there are a lot of already uh, cuts to the host galaxy as well as to the supernova itself. If the supernova doesn't follow what's known as the Phillips relation very clearly, like if it doesn't have the exact shape, light curve shape that we expect for a white dwarf, those usually get cut. So there are quite strict sample selection requirements to even use type 1a supernovae as standardizable candles. Uh, so I, I, and I think for the most part that those are probably safe. The biggest issue is that the criteria that we use to understand type 1a supernovae, or to, to use type 1a supernovae as standardizable candles, those are purely empirical. So all of those cuts are based on the color of the supernova or the overall shape of the light curve, which we which probably correlate with uh, cutting out, how do I put this? They probably correlate with being pretty, <laughs> with physical properties yeah. uh, in the sense that we're probably actually getting a quite homogeneous sample of type 1a mm -hmm. supernovae. But yeah. we don't really understand how we're doing that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, al although there does appear to be, even if you have, this, even if this textbook picture is not the only picture, typically the, um, the way that we use these uh, standardizable candles is by comparing what's known as the stretch, which is the, the length of sort of the duration of the light curve, and then the peak of the light curve. And both of those things are driven by, so the peak of the light curve is driven by the overall uh, explosion how do I put this? Hold on. I think I have a good slide that might explain this a little better than what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Give me a second. Nope, I don't have it here. That's okay. Um, but they, they're both, they both have to do with the mass of nickel. So typically if you have, a, if you have more, so <laughs> the light curve is powered by the radioactive decay of nickel. So if you have more nickel, you have a higher peak mm -hmm. light curve but you also have a longer duration. I see. Does that make sense? So the, the combined, the overall shape, the stretch of the light curve are usually proportional with each other, even if the mass of the white dwarf changes. I see. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that yeah, was but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I, I guess it comes from my ignorance about how you actually utilize these kind of objects in order for you to measure the Hubble concept. But when you said that you, you have very strict cuts, for instance, in the color of the of the, of the supernova that you are observing, that actually makes a lot of sense because that should, of course, correlate with the physics of the of the phenomena. Right. So, yeah. yeah, I think the issue is that, again, all of those corrections are totally empirical. Yeah. Like we've made them up based on observable properties and we don't really understand why we're doing those things. So that I think would help a lot. Yeah. yeah. And now actually Professor Elizabeth has a question. Go ahead, Betch. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. Uh, very, very nice talk. Thanks. And um, <clears throat> I have two questions. One regards the, the derivations, the new derivations that you have uh, performed with Kennicott and others, star-formation laws. And actually, I was looking into your nice diagram for starburst galaxies, and it looks like in the first section for the less massive starburst galaxies, it looks like that the the trend is very similar to the to the general uh, to the to the normal trend for normal galaxies, isn't that so? In this first this first part in in black, uh, 
in, in the diagram. Yeah, so you mean this part right here? This is the, the, the trend, yes, in the less yeah. massive part looks like uh, the, the same trend, the, the Kennecott law for, uh, for galaxies, normal galaxies, galaxies in general, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the trend, the, the slope. Then you have uh, for the more massive ones, we see that there is kind of a saturation. So the, the slope changes, uh, suggesting that, okay, we, ca we cannot um, uh, expect that the star formation rate will grow indefinitely, you know, with the mass mm -hmm. of galaxies. We might expect some kind of, of saturation or, you know, eventually. So my, my question is, uh, do, uh, so this might be, I, I should be kind of expected, right? But mm -hmm. I was wondering if you guys have uh, other interpretation for, for this behavior, in, uh, I mean. Yes, yeah. So when we classify galaxies as starburst galaxies, we are already, <clears throat> as you mentioned, we're looking at sort of the most extreme systems. Exactly. So the systems that are, as you said, sort of saturated up here. Uh, what we think is that, well, we think that one potential interpretation, which we're trying, we're trying to figure out how to actually observationally test this, is that when we look at spiral galaxies, typical spiral galaxies, we're looking at sort of a, so starburst galaxies go through a cycle where we have, you know, the actual burst phase, and here's sort of the extreme end of the burst, and then here's the extreme end of the sort of quiescent phase. Right. So it's, it's possible that, you're, as you say, the trend is similar but that there's a little bit of offset as we've shown here. And that offset might be because we're looking at very extreme systems. So we're trying to see if there's sort of an intermediate system that might connect the two a little more fully. Does that make sense? Right, 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 yeah. And that I think is in line with your interpretation that it's, if you, that this might be a continuous trend where it's like a, a sort of single trend and then it sort of saturates. Yeah. But I think we really need to fill in that middle piece to, to be sure. Right, right, yeah. But it, interesting, it looks like you are getting to that, to that zone, right, in this saturation. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, very good. Yeah, very that's, the, that's the hope. It is still a lot more empty than we would like. And part of that, the other, the other issue is that when we look at these starburst galaxies, and this, the, the, we're measuring the gas ab uh, abundances, or the gas, not abundances, the gas densities very differently in these two yeah. systems. Oh, right, and, right. Right, so starburst galaxies are almost entirely molecular gas. Right, right. And right. we run into issues with how we actually measure that molecular gas from CO. CO becomes really difficult to convert to molecular gas at such high densities. Uh, and then in the spiral systems, we're also able to measure atomic gas, not just molecular gas. Right. So I think one thing that we should try to get at is sort of a more consistent way to measure gas densities across this entire uh, range. Because right now there is a very distinct difference between our methods, which is probably contributing to any potential offset. Right, right. And my other question, if I may, mm -hmm. is very short. Uh, why puffy uh, this term mathematically? Mm -hmm. What does it mean <laughs> for puffy? No, that's a good question, right. So the idea is instead of uh, disky, uh, very sort of cold accretion disks. I mm -hmm. think puffy was chosen as spheroidal like or something like a. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. something that's a little more spheroidal, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Or more, yeah. Well, is spheroidal the right? Yeah, something. Yeah, something where the orbits of stars are not in a coherent disk okay. and are more dispersion supported. Right. You're right. Puffy is a, sort of a silly word to use, but I think that is actually what the literature has been moving about. towards. So. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. interesting because these are more isolated systems, right? So it's mm -hmm. more difficult to 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 get tidal forces that can uh, drive uh, the, the rotation yes. and the fast rotation and formation of a disk-like system, right? So again, it's it's reasonable that they are more puffy because the these are systems in isolated. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I think traditionally, so originally the picture was actually the opposite. The picture was that everything should form as a disk from sort of the classic yeah. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, cold gas collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the tidal interactions actually produce the puffiness. So mm -hmm. this is why we see the dwarf spheroidal galaxies that are very close to the Milky Way that look like spheroids. Right. But then further out, you actually get 
irregular, almost mini spiral galaxies. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the thought was that it's actually the tidal interactions with the Milky Way that are that are puffing these galaxies up. The recent ones, yeah, that, that, that's yeah. True. yeah, but long period isolated systems, it makes sense that they, they end up with this puffy. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, and I think that's what's been seen in simulations now. So we're sort of moving away from this picture of tidal stirring or tidal forcing that's mm -hmm. causing the puffiness. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. And Thank again, you. nice talk. Very nice talk. Thanks a lot. So I think we can actually use this opportunity to finish on time for once. <laughs> and yeah. And Richard, if you want to end the transmission. So before and before that, I would like to thank you, Mia, once again for your nice talk on behalf of the organizing committee of the seminars and on behalf of the department. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure.